Hey guys, Colin here, hope you're well. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at a super interesting sample which takes advantage of a Microsoft Office vulnerability in the way it handles EPS files in order to silently execute a malicious file on your machine. So let me just kind of explain that a different way. We have a malicious Word document that all you have to do is double click to open it and it will drop an executable to the disk and silently execute it and call out to a C2 server without you having to enable any macros, without having any kind of protected view. This happens kind of before the um, actual Office application is loaded in full to the user and will kind of happen under the hood because of a vulnerability which exists in the way that uh, Office handles this particular file type, these EPS files. The issue has subsequently been patched, so you should definitely get up to date on your patches, but it is something we're seeing out in the wild quite prevalent at the moment, and we've seen this sample. This particular sample was uploaded to VirusTotal about a week ago. It was first noted back in 2015, this particular vulnerability, so it's definitely been around for a while, but we're seeing kind of rehashing of it uh, and there's a couple of different CVEs which cover the particular exploit within Office as well so I'll post all the links to the uh, kind of interesting write-ups on this one for you to take a kind of deep dive but what I want to show you is how to analyze the malware how to strip out the actual exploit code so you can see it if you for yourself under the hood uh, and also have a look at the binary that's dropped to disk and disassemble it really quickly so you can pull out all of the indicators that you need to protect yourselves against this particular attack in your environment so this is the sample we'll take a look at as I say it was uploaded to Office about a week ago we got really good detection from uh, um, the antivirus vendors and hopefully that will continue to grow as well. So here it is, I've got a 32-bit Windows 7 VM going, I've got Office 20, 2010 installed uh, and I've got Process Hacker on the go, I've got Procmon just having a look at process creations and I've also just got uh, Wireshark just ticking away in the background here as well just looking for uh, TCP connections. So watch what happens here, right? So when I'm going to double click on the, on the file, and then just watch what happens and I'll flip back to Process Hacker as soon as I can uh, in order to see the child processes. So you see FLT, LDR.exe and then we see this child process, right? This winword.exe fire. Float loader goes away, we get winword.exe win remains persistent uh, and is, is executing silently on the machine. I didn't enable macros, all I did was double click the file. So that's really interesting. And in fact, if, even if I close Word, we say, yeah, just close it, whatever. Go back to um, Process Hacker, we see this winword um, uh, process just kind of remains persistent. If I have a look at the properties and see where the actual process exists, we can see it's been written to the startup folder on my machine. So the bad guys have somehow managed to drop an executable to disk and not and execute it, but not, not only that, they've put it in a persistent location. So the next time my machine boots up, guess what? It's gonna, it's gonna uh, execute again and again and again until I actually remove the malware. So let's copy that. I'm just gonna put it back onto my host just so we can, um, and I've got a copy here, we'll, uh, we'll replace it, just make sure we're working off the uh, the current version. Uh, and then we'll do some analysis on that in just a second. But let me roll back my snapshots and let me get a clean copy of my uh, machine here and just uh, we'll put some, uh, I'll go to a snapshot here which has got some debuggers on as well so we can kind of use it to poke around the system and see what's going on as well. So the first thing I wanna show you is how to strip apart the, uh, the Word document. So let me go back to my uh, finder here and let me just copy it back across. Uh, we'll paste it. What we can actually do is just use 7-zip, for example, to unzip the files within Word doc. Um, and it might complain a little bit, but we actually we get the, the, the folders uh, and the content of the kind of zip content, the, zip, the, the, the unarchived content of the actual Office application. Let's go into the Word folder. Uh, we can see there's a media file, a media folder, and we can see this uh, image1.eps file, which is actually where the vulnerability exists. I've got no prior experience with EPS files, but EPS stands for encapsulated postscript, and any file which has the word script in it, uh, it definitely gets my attention and something which you should be very wary of in your environment and something which the bad guys are obviously uh, very clued up on as well. So let me copy this to, just to um, uh, just for kind of safekeeping. And we'll have a look actually in a text editor, I'll stick it in Sublime, and we can see actually what the contents of this particular EPS file um, actually contains. So we see there's loads of kind of like uh, declarations going on, there's some scripting language which I don't really understand. Uh, there's an awful lot of comments as well. So stuff which is prefixed by percent percent is a comment and can be ignored. This is just kind of noise which has been um, uh, put into the code to kind of put you off your analysis and what we see here is this massive big blob of data in the middle as well uh, which is weird so right above that a couple of a couple of paragraphs above just ignore the noise as I say we see the word XOR and then just above that as well we see this very small um, string of what looks to be hexadecimal uh, bytes so we have 785d5e20 so uh, four uh, bytes of a hexadecimal string 
So that's cool. I see I see a small hex string. I see the word XOR. I see a, a really big string. Uh, I want to kind of XOR these together and see what, actually what comes out of it. So that's exactly what we'll do. Uh, and I've written a quick script. A script. Anyone knows me and knows that I like JavaScript because it's super easy to write code in. And I don't have to worry about the kind of lower level stuff of memory management and all the rest of it. Um, so I've copied in the, the ciphertext as a variable, the key as a variable, and a couple of functions which I've written re really, really quickly. There's probably a few ways you can do this, but this is just kind of how I was thinking uh, of the code when I wrote it. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do is I'm going to split these uh, strings into arrays of hexadecimal um, uh, hexadecimal bytes. So the arrays is going to we're going to break them up into two characters at a time and then just store each of those two characters in an array. I'm going to treat them as hexadecimal digits or characters. Uh, we'll do that for both the ciphertext and both the key, and then we're going to XOR each byte in each array together. Uh, but obviously the key is a lot smaller or a lot shorter in length than the actual ciphertext. So every time we kind of reach the end of the key, we're going to loop back around to the key and start again at the, at the start of the key. Uh, and that, that key will just kind of repeat through uh, the ciphertext and XOR each byte together. And that's what the XOR arrays function does. Then I'm just going to uh, convert it back to hexadecimal from its decimal uh, notation, which is what the uh, hex from deck uh, function does. And then all I'm going to do is spit it out to the console. So if you're using Windows, you can use C script, for example, and just replace console.log with W script.echo, uh, but for these purposes, I like to use Node.js and I can just run this in my terminal window on my Mac, for example. So I run Node decode and I get this massive big blob of text which comes out. So let me just pipe that out to a, a text file. So I'll just say, I'll call it out.text. Let me go back here and we'll open uh, out.text and we can see this is massive big blob of hexadecimal data. But now what I can do is I can copy that. Let me go back into my windows. I can use something like hxd, for example, create a new file, paste it, click OK, uh, and let's save that, and we'll call this output.bin for now. Uh, and then we've got this file, and if we have a look at the ASCII representation, let me go right to the top. I've got loads of strings, I've got loads of stuff actually, which kind of looks a little bit familiar, like, like what we've just seen with the EPS file. It seems like we just peeled back another layer of the malware, so another layer of the of the decoding that we needed to, to kind of uh, have a look at and, uh, and see what this particular stuff does as well. So let's uh, grab output.bin. Let me copy that back to my host, uh, and we'll have a look again in uh, a text editor, output.bin. Let's just go to uh, sublime.txt, and we'll have a look and see what this contains. Well, the first thing is this is a little bit noisier, uh, but we can see there's some more strings being defined. We can see there's a few API calls as well. We've got kernel 32 DLL, and we've got uh, get interval. We've got NT protect virtual memory. That's super interesting. Um, and we've got this other big blob of um, encoded data. Uh, what I didn't see, though, was any any kind of reference to XOR or any kind of stuff which might suggest that this is encoded in any way. So what you could do is just kind of strip this out uh, and then stick it straight again into a hex editor, and you can see the hex, uh, the ASCII representation of that hexadecimal um, stuff. So we can do that right here, um, and that's great. And we've got that um, in our text editor here, our HXD editor here. Um, and if you have a look at the strings, we can see to kernel 32, we can see load library A, we can see get proc address, we can see uh, NT allocate uh, virtual memory, NT protect virtual memory, and also get current process. So the kind of stuff which is required for the um, for the shell code to find itself in memory uh, and also start doing some bad stuff in terms of being able to create the process and write memory um, to to the file system as well. So this is you know this is the kind of layer we'll go to. If you wanted to, you could perform some additional analysis what I probably recommend you do is put this shell code into a disassembler and have a look at the actual exploit yourselves and walk through it but that's a little bit outside of this tutorial but what we will now do is have a look at um, the actual binary that dropped a disk so let me just not save that for now let me have a look at winword.exe so we know that the shell code actually was designed to drop this executable to disk so this is kind of the output of the vulnerability and the exploit within office doc it, it dropped this executable this is what the shell code is designed to do so we saw it reach uh, out to a particular IP address. What we need to do is have a look at uh, under the hood what what is going on um, with this with this disassembly. So we can stick it in the likes of x64. Uh, and the good thing we can see, if we have a look, for example, we can have a look in the symbols uh, and we can see quite a lot of imports here. So it doesn't look like this particular binary is packed uh, and that's a good start for us. And one of the things I like to do when we've got something which doesn't look like it's packed is have a look at the actual strings uh, in the process as well. And we can see here, we've got a couple of IP addresses which are hard coded into the malware. Well, that's that's pretty interesting. Uh, it makes life easy in, in order to extract network indicators. It looks like we've got um, a user agent string here as well. 
and we've got a uh, file name Microsoft Update.exe, uh, and then we've got some other stuff going on as well. It looks like it's looking at particular drive letters and, and stuff like that. So I've just put a few breakpoints on those uh, particular indicators that, that look interesting to me. We can see this get.php name equals and then a percent %x uh, parameter as well. That'd be interesting to see what's actually being built up into there. So go back to CPU view, press F9 to actually run the malware, and we can see if we just give it a second or so, we can see in the, in the bottom left that the malware, is, it says it's running, uh, and hopefully it'll get to the stage where it'll actually pause on one of our breakpoints, and we can see here that it's paused on uh, the get.php uh, and the name equals x whatever. Uh, and that's interesting, right? So we can see that uh, it's going to um, you create this parameter, which is, is probably going to be used in order to, to kind of feed back into the, into part of the C2 communications. Uh, that's great. And you can kind of step through it and see what that is going to be created to. You can keep pressing F8, 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 uh, or whatever, and keep going. But what we'll do is press F9 and see where we get to the next breakpoint. And we do, and we get to the next breakpoint, and that's where uh, the binary is trying to connect to, or at least we've got the API calls for the binary to connect to the hard-coded IP address. And we can see it's a GET request, and we can see all of the API commands around it. Easy way to do it to have a look at it in a bit more detail is press G uh, and that will take us to graph view and we can see the, the kind of process flow a little bit easier. We can see Internet Connect, Internet Connect A, open request, send request, read file and then close the handle. Interestingly enough, it looks like it's now off the back of actually opening that request, it's going to look at the response and it's going to compare it to a few different things. The first thing it's going to compare it to is it's going to have a look to see whether the response uh, string starts with the letter F. A and then L. And then actually what we've seen when we perform some additional analysis on this is it's looking for the string false. So there's a false string returned. If the bad guy doesn't like you or doesn't want to infect you or is not ready yet to send the next command, it's just going to send a false string back. So the, the, the malware is designed to look for that false string and then it's going to execute a particular code block depending on whether or not it finds it. Uh, if it does or it doesn't, it's also going to look for uh, a string called DEL, which presumably means delete. Uh, and we can see the, the kind of substring comparison there. And if it does get that, uh, it, it, you can see here the test is on EAX. So if it does compare uh, those strings and it finds it, we see a test of EAX, which is where the uh, the return is going to be stored in the in the actual registry. Um, the, the next instruction is JNE, uh, and it will jump to that particular location if the um, value in EAX is not equal to zero. So if it's not equal to zero, then we're actually going to follow this path down here, which it's going to write um, an entry to the current version run uh, registry key, which is going to give it some persistence. And actually, then it's going to kind of close down uh, and not do too much. Um, so that's pretty boring. So what actually we want to see the malware do, though, is see what happens when it gets a, a positive response, i.e. it doesn't get the false, it doesn't get the, the actual delete uh, response from the C2. What is it looking for? If we go down the other branch of the code, we can see actually what it's looking for is the string H, T, T, and P. So presumably it's going to be passed back another URL if the malware is ready on the other side, on the server side, on the C2 side. If the bad guy decides, yeah, this is a target which is interesting to me and I want to it, it's going to pass it back a HTTP string, presumably, in order for it to execute. And if we have a look a little bit further down, we can see we see uh, get special folder path A, uh, which in this case, if you debug it, it will be the temp directory. It writes a file name Microsoft Update.exe, uh, and then we'll actually write the contents, and we can see the create process here as well. Uh, and then the shell execute subsequently, the, it will uh, open and execute the file, uh, which is the um, the kind of, which will contain the response of whatever that HTTP string is that's going to be passed back from the initial C2. Uh, so that's it. That's super interesting. Hopefully you've seen there how you can kind of rip apart um, shellcode and uh, a vulnerability in Word super, super easy in order to extract the key indicators and also find a way in which that you can um, analyze the, the binary that it, that, that it drops under the hood super quickly in order to extract all of the indicators that you need to protect your environment. Hopefully that's useful. Don't forget, if you like the video, then subscribe to my channel. You can also check me out on Twitter at CyberCDH. Uh, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks, guys.